Yeah, thank you, Anne. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, you know, I just want to speak a little bit about this trial presentation, sorry, this trial basic series that we're uh, putting on. Chances are, if you're here today, then you'll have an interest in the other presentations. We have some presentations uh, already in the can and already recorded, and later on I'll ask Anne to explain how you can access them, and then we have two more coming in May and June, and I'll tell you a little bit about those. Uh, this has been put on by the, the trial basic series is being put on by the barrister section and the litigation section, as well as the education committee. And I want to thank Anne a lot for all of her work that she's done helping put this together and really heard all the cats that we needed to make this effective. So going back to the MCLE spectacular last November, we had a presentation called theory of the case. It was just sort of you know, big, big picture type of uh, matters for, for any case you're handling. In January, we had discovery and depositions, the meat and potatoes of trial preparation. In February, we had what do you want and how do you get it, framing issues and drafting pleadings. In March, we had jury selection and opening closing statements. Today, we have the presentation on direct and cross-examination. May on May 10th, we have mediation, what, why, when, and how. And June 7th, we have creating trial presentations, everything you didn't know you needed to know. And this series so far has really been, been amazing. Surprisingly, I've even learned things. So I know that's, that might come as a shock to you. So it's really been worth it. I highly recommend going into uh, checking out the old ones and coming for the future ones as well. And then after that, we're going to start putting together an advanced trial series down the road to continue what we've started here. So at this point, uh, I'd like to introduce Scott Lantry. Actually, before we move on, Ann, could you just explain uh, briefly how to access the programs or if you think it's easier to put it in the chat, whatever you think yeah. is best. The, the Bar Association has a self-study web page, so just pop into the Bar Association main page. Um, where you'll see a lovely picture of Judge Austin. Um, you wanted me to remind you of that. And then, and then you can go to um, the self-study page and uh, the trial series will, will have its own little anchor and you can find all the programs there. You can watch them um, as, as you will, or you can watch them for credit, um, turning in a form, and, and then we can give you credit. So that's entirely up to you. If you have any questions, just let me know. I recommend reaching out to Anne if you have any questions. She knows everything. Um, so Scott Lantry is our moderator today. He's going to be introducing the panelists and helping us through this journey today. I actually know him going all the way back to law school, and I won't share the embarrassing stories, but I will say I was actually, I remember being very impressed with him back in the day. I was always very terrified by professors calling on me, but whenever he was called upon, he seemed to handle it very smoothly and have really creative out of the box thinking responses. So currently Scott is a partner with Whiting, Ross, Abel and Campbell where he practices family law excuse, exclusively. Uh, he started with that firm actually as a file room clerk where I was told he specialized in making photocopies and brewing coffee. Um, now he's actually had his specialization change from that. He is now actually certified by the State Bar of California as a specialist in the field of family law, which is actually a, a pretty big deal and hard to attain. So it shows uh, his chops. And he has been named to the Super Lawyers Rising Stars list going back uh, since 2017. So Scott, uh, take it away. Thank you, Adam. I'm gr very grateful for the kind introduction. Uh, and I have to say that, that to the extent that I was a gunner in law school, Adam was, was one of the cool kids. And so uh, if, if the admiration uh, was certainly returned or even envy, I don't know. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, three other panelists. I'll begin with uh, my friend and colleague, Eva Silva. Eva is the managing partner at Shar and Silva LLP, a boutique personal injury law firm in the South Bay. Uh, they're affiliated with Trial Lawyers for Justice. They do a lot of work with uh, Nick Rowley. Eva has been in that realm, personal injury, for her entire career. She loves the courtroom almost as much as Elle Woods. 
Uh, and uh, um, as we'll, we'll see in just a moment, she's still waiting for that L. Woods, Perry Mason moment. We'll, we'll get into that more uh, later. Uh, my friend and colleague, Teresa Lee, uh, uh, well, her trial success has been a subject of national publications. Uh, since she moved over to the plaintiff's side about five years ago, she's recovered over $20 million on behalf of her injured clients. Uh, she's tried 13 civil cases. She's been repeatedly selected uh, by super lawyers also as a rising star uh, by San Francisco Magazine as among its top lawyers and also by Northern California rising stars and top women attorneys in Northern California. All of those since 2014. Uh, and our headliner for tonight, and I'm sure the reason uh, why you're all here, is Judge Austin, who has served as a trial court judge in the uh, Superior Court of Contra Costa since 1998. His last assignment was as the supervising judge for the Civil Department in Martinez. He served as a branch court supervising judge and as a member of the court's executive committee. He was PJ in 2015 and in 2016. Uh, he recently retired, is, is happy to tell you about all of his new hiking uh, trails that he's found. And uh, he starts his new career as a mediator with ADR services. So with the introductions behind us, I, I wanna begin by saying that among a number of motivating factors that drew me to law school, and that drew me to the career path of litigator was the story of L. Woods. And uh, uh, in particular, I was moved, and I hope one day, like Eva, to replicate uh, the success that uh, L. had uh, in her first cross-examination. And Anne, uh, assuming we have uh, the capability, I would be most grateful if you could play that scene for us. Uh, an unrehearsed sharing of a Facebook video. So hold on, everyone. Let's see if we can make this happen. Oh, let's get sound on. Hold on. There we go. So she's in the shower. Twenty minutes that you were in the shower, your father was shot. I guess. Your father was shot while you were in the shower, but you didn't hear the shot because um, because you were in the shower. Yes, I was washing my hair. Where is she going? Got a latte, went to the gym, got a perm, and came home. Were you got in the shower? I believe the witness has made it clear that she was in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Um, Miss Wyndham, had you ever gotten a perm before? Yes. How many would you say? to a year since I was 12. You do the math. You know, a girl in my sorority, Tracy Marcinko, got a perm once. We all tried to talk her out of it. Girls weren't a good look for her. She didn't have a good instruction. But thankfully, that same day, she entered the Beta Delta Pi wet t-shirt contest where she was completely hosed down from head to toe. Objection. Why is this relevant? Oh, I have a point, I promise. Then make it. Um, Chani, why is it that Tracy Marcinko's curls were ruined when she got hosed down? Because they got wet? Exactly. Because isn't it the first cardinal rule of perm maintenance that you're forbidden to wet your hair for at least 24 hours after getting a perm at the risk of deactivating the ammonium thiglocolate? Yes. And wouldn't somebody who's had, say, 30 perms before in their life be well aware of this rule? 
And if, in fact, you weren't washing your hair, as I suspect you weren't because your curls are still intact, wouldn't you have heard the gunshot? And if, in fact, you had heard the gunshot, Brooke Wyndham wouldn't have had time to hide the gun before you got downstairs, which would mean that you would have had to have found Mrs. Wyndham with a gun in her hand to make your story plausible. Isn't that right? She's my age. Did she tell you that? How would you feel if your father married someone who was your age? You, however, had time to hide the gun, didn't you, Chetney? After you shot your father. I didn't mean to shoot him. I thought it was you walking through the door. Order, order. Order. Oh, oh my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I'm very grateful that we shared that. Uh, uh, and there's only a slight tinge of regret. There was a round of applause after, immediately after it cut. And so uh, uh, two comments. Number one, uh, this is gonna be a question and answer uh, forum. And I, as moderator, I'm gonna ask a lot of the questions, but I really encourage all the participants to chime in. And I keep my eye on both the Q&A tab as well as the chat tab. So I want everybody to be participatory, ask questions, let's keep this going. I'll ask the first question. Panelists, have you ever done a cross-examination where you got a round of applause afterwards? No. No? No. no. In my head, mm. kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I think my fair answer is I wish, but I'm just not that cool. No. All right, so the first serious question. Um, now, when I'm working with a client and I'm trying to get the client to understand the process, uh, specifically of trial and, and of uh, direct examination and cross-examination. Um, I try to educate them about the fact that I consider myself a competitive storyteller, okay? And that a trial process is at its core, a storytelling process. So, um, you know, uh, uh, with that in mind, kind of a general question to the panel, um, you know, is do you say something similar to your clients when you're getting them ready for uh, direct and cross examination? Uh, and how do you go about getting them ready for that? Um, I can start this one. I, I do say something similar to them. We start off by kind of letting them know. Um, actually, what we really do to begin with is get to know their story, right? They're the ones who have to give us the story. So we have to learn about everything they've been through, what their damages are. Um, the better we know their story and the facts, the better we're going to do telling that story and guiding it through the direct and cross exam. Um, and so we do tell clients that they need to help us tell a story and we just make sure that we know it as well as possible. Um, kind of jumping a little further with that, that's really where most of our prep is, is in getting the knowledge about the client's story and knowing where to go with it so that we can kind of act as a guide during direct exam, if something goes a little bit off the rails, we can pull it back to where it needs to go instead of being completely out and left field for a long period of time. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with Eva. And then what I do usually is I retain a jury consultant to prep my client for direct and cross. Um, the things usually said is that because most people have never try a case, never been to trial, they get really nervous. Um, that's one thing. So you want to make sure they understand that they're only there to tell their story as a innocent bystander. Like they are there to give the information a jury needs to hear. They're not there to, you know, just unleash whatever they wanted to say. They're there with one job is to give the information that the jury wants to hear in order to make the right decision. And we also tell our clients that they're not there to litigate. I am there to litigate. So they have to have confidence in their lawyers. So I don't want my client to get up there to be defensive or argue their case, because that won't look good. Um, and when you get to the courtroom, you feel the ground, you feel the table, so you feel grounded. Um, it's very important to because when people are nervous, they, they don't connect. They don't connect with the jury. They start reciting things. Um, so that's, that's all very, very important. And when across, we usually um, 
prep the client because depositions usually are taken. So you know what, what wrong answer they already gave in the depot and you go through it. And then the things to do is, um, I think the jury consultant, Karen Jo Kunin always said, it's like a, a helium balloon. So the more you punch it, the higher it goes. So the way to deal with bad facts or the bad testimony, you wanna poke the balloon so it deflates. So for example, if the client says something like, uh, the bus started and then my husband sat down. So he was not sitting down at the time the bus started, but in fact he was, and then said something different in the deposition. So how do you deal with that? You have a conflicting testimony in the deposition. It's an important piece of information. You know it's gonna be asked by the defense. So you deal with it in the direct. And when, they, when it's asked, you can just say, I misspoke in the depot. And that's all you need to say. You don't need to go into like, I was nervous, there's a translator, blah, blah, blah. Because it sounds like you're, you're trying to explain something away, but just say, at the time the bus started, my husband already sat down. Yes, I said something different. I misspoke. That's it. Like, don't go into explanation. So you want to prep the client on both the direct and the cross. I think that all those were, that's just great advice. It's a, a, a way to focus the client and focus yourself on on uh, getting the message across to the jury, which is what your goal is when you're in trial. A lot of people forget about that. And I know what it's like to be in civil practice. And what you're doing is every day generating discovery. I see plenty of that. <laughs> and you're generating depositions and you're trying to uncover facts. And it's really hard to flip that switch and turn to trial because you're spending so much of your daily life doing that. And there's people don't have trials like they used to. So you know, you get one or two, you know, one a year, maybe if you're lucky, maybe less than that. And it's really hard to, to turn that switch on and say, this is trial now, different world, bring your client into that world with you before you start and, and make sure that they know that, hey, this is a new deal. This is something here. We are selling our, our, what we have um, and we have some good facts, but you have to be part of the sales team here. <laughs> kind of in a way. And, and you need to you need to make sure that they know that, that we're all together on this. Make sure that they know what the theme is, I think. Uh, and you, if you don't have a theme for your trial, you, you, you're, you're, you're already behind. So well, I think it's a good idea to make sure if you have a trial, you could have a, a liability theme and a damage theme, you can put them both together, but well, you could have minor things, but really big picture, a lot of times I put them on, I've seen lawyers do it, put it at the top of their page with every witness what the theme is. You turn the page. So it always reminds you what your theme is to get back to it because re repetition really helps. And that your client would know that too, I think is important. Yeah. You know, and, and with, with that in mind, a, a segue to the next question. Um, I believe Adam uh, Carlson took the same evidence class that I did with Professor McCaskill. And one of the things that stuck with me from, uh, uh, from that class was, you know, a trial is like a wall and you have to build it brick by brick. And the brick, each brick is its own discrete piece of evidence, all of which building the wall, the wall is your narrative is probably a better example. So collectively, you know, um, so my question now to the panel is how do you build the wall? More specifically, please describe your creative process, what you do in your office, wherever you, you are when you're being creative, um, to prepare yourself. I'm more interested in how you prepare yourself. Certainly we can talk about how you prepare the witness, but I'm really keen on your own personal creative process that leads you to walking into trial uh, uh, knowing you're prepared. Because again, if, any, if there's anything that L. Woods taught us, it's the importance of preparation. I can go first on this one too. The, the, um, the big thing for us is we do a lot of focus groups. Um, we do them informally and it forces us to practice. So we'll go on Craigslist, um, find a group of people. We you know, just put an advertisement out there, say, hey, on um, you know, this date, we're gonna do a focus group for an hour. Sometimes we'll just do a focus group on a tiny discrete issue. Sometimes we just wanna practice doing voir dire. 
Sometimes we want to do it on one witness. Sometimes I have a client who I'm concerned is going to come in and be defensive on cross exam and they need to practice. And so we will put them in front of the focus group. We will put our own presentation of the evidence in front of the focus group and listen to their feedback. Um, I have gotten some of the best advice from focus groups because they are the ones, they're just like the people who are gonna be on our juries. And I'm sorry, after a certain amount of time, we're not like lay people anymore when we get ready for trial. We don't think the same way. We don't care about the same things or we're just stuck in the weeds. Like Judge Austin just said, I get stuck in the weeds on my cases with my discovery constantly. The hardest thing is pulling myself back up to that 60,000 foot level at trial, looking down and going, okay, what is it that this needs to look like? A focus groups really help us get through that process. They help us get out the good facts, figure out what the bad facts are so we can get them ahead of time. Because sometimes we have a different understanding of what a bad fact is in our mind and what the jury is actually gonna care about. Um, so I say focus groups, that's what we use. We use them not only for our own presentations, but, but we use them for our witnesses too. Um, we have them go in and practice when we're really concerned about them. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Eva. Focus group is it's so important because we're in a case for so long, so many years sometimes, and we kind of, you know, have our own blind spot. And, you know, all we talk to is our clients and so we're very much advocating for our clients and then that sometimes make you miss some of the facts or information that we're taking for granted that other people might find important. Um, I think focus group is really important uh, not to test the result because the sample size is too small, but to test like what facts, if given, whether that would change somebody's mind and why. And I think that's more important than um, if everybody in the focus group voted for your client or not. Um, but also just going back to the theme, I think you know every good storyteller knows the power of three. So when you talk about, um, talk about things, you wanna talk about three things that defendant had done wrong. You wanna talk about three, when you tell the story, talk about three damaged things what they could do before, now they cannot. It's just more effective to uh, use the power three when you're doing it in your opening, closing, direct, and cross-examination. You wanna get that theme across with the jury and know the evidence well. You know, you know what key evidence you need to get in in order to win. For every key evidence, you need to think about at least two different ways to get in because <laughs> Some of them may not work. Things happen. I think that's great advice. And even if you don't have the money to, to do a focus group, it doesn't cost that much. Something on Craigslist is nothing. But um, but you could always get it. I used to always think, what do my Aunt Alice and Uncle Lou think about this? And in fact, I would call them up. <laughs> hey, I got this trial. This is about to happen. What do you think about this? And my Uncle Lou was not easy. Uh, and so. Uh, and I knew that they were like a lot of the people that would be on the jury and you just get a completely different perspective. Sometimes it just take, takes your whole head, changes it completely from where you've been because you're, you're in the, the, the weeds. And plus, you've got your client there. I, I know we've already talked about that, but sometimes you start, you bond with the client, you understand what they've gone through, uh, both defense and, and, and plaintiff side, I think both ways you end up doing it. And um instead of looking at what you have to look at, which is what the jury's gonna do. That's all you really should care about. Not so much, I mean, it's important to care about your client, but really at the end, when you're valuing the case and how you're gonna try it, you have to think how, how, how what, 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 what the jury is going to wanna to hear, what's gonna be persuasive to the jury. That should be your only goal. Yeah, and I, I echo that, particularly in the context of family law, uh, where I live, you know, it's so easy to lose perspective, to objectivity, detachment. You know, we, we travel these difficult journeys with these people and, uh, um, and it's, it's vital you, you, you maintain that objectivity, number one. And number two, I like to, as the case progresses, just go back, reopen the file, reread it um, with fresh eyes. Because if you've lived it, um, again, you lose that perspective. So, let me really? just break in there for a second on family. Just from yes. my year in family, I, I saw Judge Douglas is on here too. She was there plenty of time. Um, it's 
that if you're in family law, that is the biggest thing because you just got the judge. The judge is different than the jury. The judge has heard it all. They've heard everything more than what they want to hear most of the time. And if you're as an attorney coming across as being someone who has taken into consideration what's important for the judge to hear, as opposed to what's important for your client to say and and have heard, which is a different whole world than what it is important for the judge to make the decision. Um, you, you go up about five notches. <laughs> it really, whenever that happened, when I was in family law, I just said, okay, great. Okay, I'm listening. I, I listen to everybody, but that really catches your attention when somebody clearly has done that. Now, drilling down a little bit further into uh, how you prepare, I'm really interested in how you prepare your witnesses, um, you, particularly, obviously, your, your friendly witnesses, your own client for direct and for cross examination. Um, what does that process look like? And a related question would be, um, how often, as it might in a way be a silly question, how often do they go off script or more to the point, what do you do when they say something that, that might blindside you, that you weren't prepared for? Teresa, you had a really good answer to this when we were preparing. Yeah, so um, I think in my experience, people always go off script because nobody's going to say exactly what you want them to say. And especially in this very artificial environment, you, there's somebody going to a court, it's very intimidating. You're for testifying most of the time, first, first time in your life, and a judge is there, there's a court reporter, there's all these strangers, jury sitting there staring at you. And it's a very formal process. And I don't know anybody who voluntarily wants to go testify in court. <laughs> so yes, when people are nervous, they tend to act funny because they want to have some sort of control over it. Um, so when people do, when people do go off strip, um, I think the if it's a bad fact, you want to just quickly ask a question you know the answer to and just pretend that has not happened. The last thing you want to do is stop and stare at the witness, like, what did you just say? Because that would really draw attention uh, from the jury and everybody will wake up because they're probably thinking about their dry cleaning anyways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you just want to get that pass. But if it's if it's a good fact, you want to run with it. Like I had just a case where a, a student testified that she received uh, some video that was sexual in nature of my client and she was minor my client was a minor but on the stand she suddenly said it was an intercourse so i never heard that so i just i just ran with that um you know i keep repeating it because it's it, it's a good fact you know you just have to run with that just to dovetail off what teresa said there i mean I, we don't really have a script for our witnesses right we have an idea of what we want to get in what facts we want to get in, um, what facts we need to get in, right? Like the ones that we have to poke the balloon with, get the wind out of their sails, put the bad stuff out there first. Um, there's kind of a script, but generally speaking, it's mostly just an idea of where we want to go. And that's one of the, somebody once described it to me as though you're in a river. The story is the river. You are in a boat with your client and you have the paddle because you're the one asking the questions. You know when to stick that paddle into the river and where to get you back to the shore if you need to, right? And that's kind of the way I like to think of it in terms of going off script because they're gonna go off script. Clients always say stuff that I'm not expecting. Witnesses constantly do. Um, if, it's, if that doesn't happen, it's not a normal day at trial, right? Um, if you don't end up going back to the depot testimony and going, oh my God, they didn't say this before just is what it is. Um, and going off script, yeah, let them do it. Just be prepared to navigate your way back, especially if it's your own client. You should know the story well enough that you're able to just take it wherever it is and pull it right back to where you need it to be. And don't end uh, ringing the bell. If they've rung the bell for you with a bad fact, move over it as quickly as you can. That's once the bell is rung, you can't unring it. Just move on. Let's move forward. I'm watching lots of trials that uh, it happens every every witness at some point, they say something that you're not supposed to say, that you're not expecting they're going to say. And the best lawyers I've found, they're able to just do it like it's nothing. Like you, I could kind of sense that something just happened, 
but just because I've been watching a lot, I'm sure nobody else even knows. And so it's a, it's a thing to be prepared for. Know what's going to happen with every witness. And if it does, it's going to be okay. Get yourself on track. Don't act like it's a big deal and move on. And a lot of times nobody will even notice. They won't even know that it's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just, just, I totally agree. They're just talking about going off strip. Uh, I, I told my client to always show up where there's something best. And I stopped talking about that because I have had clients showing up in Hawaii shirt. <laughs> I have clients showing up with full on fur coat. It would just like, so I just stopped telling them uh, wearing their Sunday best because apparently that message can come across. <laughs> I, I have to specifically instruct them, put on the clothes you're going to wear and take a picture and send it to them. <laughs> <laughs> you're not That's showing the best up course. in Hawaii shirts. <laughs> Uh, I, that, that is a level of, uh, witness preparation, Eva, that I admire. Um, <laughs> you know, I, just a, just a contribution to this for me, again, going back to the creative process and how, you know, how I approach this, for example, when they go off script, you know, all I, when I was more junior, uh, an attorney, I would script it all out. Right. And now I'm much more, uh, far more concise. I just, I just say, and I think this goes back to something Judge Austin said, I just, in my notes, I just, I want to, the witness to say, or I want to establish this. And it's brief, just a couple of words, a sentence, not more. And then I know the file, so I'm going to have a conversation because that's what it is. It's a conversation. So uh, next question on a related uh, uh, topic uh, from Manuel Ugarte, great question. Do the panelists prepare differently for trial testimony as contrasted against party depositions? Um, are both equally important? What, what do we think? Um, I, I, I think it depends. Depends on who you're deposing. If you're deposing expert, it's very different from deposing uh, defendant. Um, uh, expert depo, I don't. Uh, use my ammunition because experts are smart at trial. If, if you have already asked all the questions you're going to nail the expert on in depot, more likely than not, the expert have figured out a way to get around it in trial. So you don't want to do that. You want to get the foundation. You're going to get the opinion and the basis the opinion. Is that all your opinion? Um, that's, that's where you want to do. You don't want to attack the expert, at least in my opinion. Um, with defendant, it's a little bit different because um, you are litigating case. I mean, you, 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 you are trying to find facts in discovery, but you're also trying to litigate your case. So I do ask questions that are um, not just facts finding in depot um, with the hope that at trial, I could play those uh, videos as impeachment. Yeah. Um, we prepare, it, it depends on what it's for, like Teresa said. So if we're preparing for a party deposition, like my own client's deposition versus preparing for my own client's testimony at trial, um, I would say that that's a different, it's a different setup. Um, we still do a certain number of prep sessions before a deposition, we usually have one or two, depending on the client, um, and prepare them, take them through what the process is going to be like, right? That's usually how, what a deposition is about. And what I usually tell them for a deposition is only all I need you to do is tell the truth and answer the questions that are asked of you. Listen to the admonitions and tell your story. That's where the whole story starts is in the deposition. And then once we get to trial, the preparation for us is a lot different. Um, some people spend a lot of time with their clients and their deposition testimony. I don't do that. Um, if we did the deposition right to begin with, there shouldn't be a lot of inconsistency at trial. And like Teresa said, if there is an inconsistency, you misspoke and you probably didn't mean to. Most of the time, people want to make these misstatements into, um, into lies. They want them to be intentional and they want them to be these terrible big things. And what it really is, is, oh, they didn't understand the question. Oh, they didn't quite understand what was going on. Oh, the process was a little unfair to them in that particular moment. And it's not actually a lie. When you do find the lies, they're great. You can use them. But most of the time between a deposition and trial testimony between a, a, a plaintiff or a defendant, you're not gonna find something that's that strong. Um, and it's going to just end up being something that you can move on from. 
um, and just handle it quickly. Yeah, I think it's so great to hear two really good lawyers talk about how they get prepped and the differences, because I think it, it's really good advice, just being the guy who sits and watches. Depositions are, in, it's how you get your information. So you're, you're there just being curious a lot of the time. If you get lucky, you can prepare it. So if you get lucky, you'll get maybe, what, three, four lines of deposition that you're going to get to read back in, in court one day. Um, maybe. So, if, yeah. So if you really are thinking about this as this is going to lock everybody in, I'm going to get all this stuff. It doesn't really work that well. But if you happen to get to something and you could get a good question and answer, your mind should always be thinking, this is when I could read a trial. If something comes up that I want to have a clean question, clean answer. And, um, and that is projecting over the next phase, which is now how am I going to present the information that I already know? Um, so it's different preparations, way different. One is, is, is getting the foundational information together, perhaps locking in a couple of questions. And then at the, the trial is, okay, this is what we got. These are the cards we're dealt. How do we present this in a way that is going to be persuasive to the, the judge or to the jury? I, um, I always uh, uh, say the following uh, to a client when they're facing the prospect of having to give testimony, either in a deposition or at a trial. Um, golden rule, always tell the truth. And, and in family law, it's important to repeat that sometimes. Uh, be a slave to the truth. Um, and then the second thing I say is follow the following three-step analytical process in your brain after every single question. Embrace the pause that happens when you do this, which gives me the opportunity to object or whatever. Um, and, uh, but always ask yourself the following questions. Number one, and only go to the next question if you've got a good answer to the, first, to the preceding one. Number one, do I understand the question? If no, say so. People need to be told these things. It's important, okay? Because they'll guess, you know, they'll go, they'll go crazy. Number one, do I understand the question? If no, it's okay, say so. Number two, um, am I aware of facts of which I have uh, um, uh, uh, personal knowledge responsive to the question? It's a fancy way of asking, do I know the answer? But it's more particular. And then I break down, here's what personal knowledge means. I'll also tell them the story of the careful witness, which, you know, you'll indulge me. Um, a, a careful witness and somebody are walking along the street and, they, and, and a third party asks them, what color is the house? And the other person, the non-careful witness says, oh, the house is white. The careful witness says, well, the side of the house that I can see is white. Okay. So you don't guess, essentially. You're not going to guess about what the color is on the other side of the house. And it's a good illustration of, of what they need to do. The third question is, how can I phrase this question to be responsive, non-argumentative, again, in family law, that's big, um, and uh, uh, conceals, uh, withholds, and adds nothing. So. That's, that's my contribution uh, to that. Now, something that, that Teresa uh, said in, in her response reminded me of the golden rule of cross-examination, as it's been told to me, and I think it's a good one, which is never ask a question on cross you don't already know the answer to. And I think it's also been said that the golden rule of direct examination uh, is get your bad facts out on direct steal the other side's thunder. Uh, so the question is, uh, are there any other golden rules other than the two I've mentioned that you like? And can you think of any exceptions to those golden rules? Are they, are they set in granite, never, no exceptions at all? Or, you know, what, what's been your experience? And I think there is an exception to the golden rule. That is, if everybody in a courtroom knows the answer, then you should definitely ask that question. Um, question like if you uh, say, if, if you're in an automobile accident case, you can say, if you're a driver, you see a pedestrian, you're not gonna run over him, right? I mean, that's, that's something that the answer, or the only possible answer is I'm not going to run over him. If the witness ever say something like, well, it depends, then they look bad um, or safety is your number one concern. Uh, that's something that you should definitely ask uh, in the uh, cross-examination of the defendant. 
another one is I had the uh, policy manual of a Muni driver. It says you're supposed to look at the intersection, look to the left and right and left, and then proceed. So I would ask that question. You were trained at the intersection to look to the left, then the right, then the left again before you proceed, correct? And he has to say yes, because you were trained to do so, right? And if you didn't do that, you will be critical of yourself for not doing that, right? And then let's take a look at the video. Oh, you only looked at the lap before you proceeded. I mean, you. Uh, so the facts you probably can get in a depot is that he didn't look to the right, but you could technically cross-examine him at trial uh, with the first um, a few questions that you know um, they're, you know, the jury sitting there and the judge sitting there, I'm going to know the answer to you and, and they can't, they can't say anything differently. I, I don't know that there's, I mean, they're golden rules. They're really important. I agree with them. Um, I think there's exceptions to every rule. Um, the only one I know of for cross-exam that I would really go with is the one that Teresa said. Cross-exam can be a little dangerous, right? You don't want to, you don't want to go too far. Um, that said, yeah, if you're, if you're going to make the witness argue with you and look silly, you know, isn't safety your number one concern? They're going to say yes to those questions, right? Um, you're going to be able to get answers to the obvious questions, but I wouldn't go too far with that stuff. Um, I will say, you know, the one other, um, well, there's, I think we're going to talk about it later, so I won't tell that story right now. The other golden rule, don't argue with your, with your witnesses. Um, I kind of agree with that and kind of disagree with it, but we can talk about that one a separate time. Um, with this one, though, I would stick with those golden rules. The, the one about getting the facts out ahead of time, um, I really think that's important. We had a witness on one case um, who, in her deposition, got really confused and gave testimony to specific times about certain things that happened. So the time between when her boyfriend had um, fallen off his bike and when he hit the ground. Obviously, she didn't know those things, right? But during her deposition, she had a really hard time and answered those questions and gave estimates. Um, and so during her deposition testimony, we brought it out ahead of time and said, you testified to this during your deposition. Um, you're not going to say that today. Why are you not going to say that today? And we brought it out that she actually had been confused by what was going on at the time. She was in the moment. She actually didn't watch him fall off the bike and hit the ground. She was trying, she realized that there was an accident. And then she looked away to try to put her bike down and got off and then she looked up. So there's no way that she could have given the estimates that she gave in, in any real way. It was just that she got confused during the depot. We were able to put that out at the beginning um, and the jurors were more than happy to hear and listen to everything that she'd said. And they didn't hold any of it against her because we had put it out at the beginning. And she's like, look, I just was in the moment realizing that this terrible thing had happened. You know, and you're asking me for second estimates. I don't know, yes, maybe. It's hard um, in the moment. It's very difficult. They can get that trauma out there. They can get, you know, how terrifying it is when you actually get them into the moment of the story. Um, that's the other thing that happens when you go through and prepare someone for direct exam um, by trying to get the bad facts out. Usually the bad facts are part of your story. Embrace them. Um, I tell my clients, tell me the good, the bad, and the ugly, because if you don't, I can't prepare for any of it. Right. And I need to be able to pair for those ugly facts. I have to. So we we try to get that stuff out there at the very beginning. Um, and if I don't know about it, we're messed up. <laughs> it's not going to be good. I think on the cross exam rule, it's it's a pretty good one to live by. Um, there there are times where you're tempted. You're always tempted. And it's just because we're ingrained with it. It's why we all became lawyers. It's because we watched Perry Mason. We watched L. L. Wood. Uh, I did a whole bunch of times because my daughters were the right age. So I watched that a lot. You know, we watched my cousin Vinny. We watch all these things and we think that we're going to be able to do that. And most of the times you get a trick, you got something. Ah, I got a good one here. This is going to work. And you talk maybe with your associate or somebody else. Hey, yeah, I got this one. I'm going to get this one. And then it doesn't work. And so, so that's, I mean, and I've seen it sitting in the chair a lot. People have them, they think it's gonna work. And I could feel what went on as they were pre prepping to do this and it doesn't work. Um, occasionally, once in a while it does, and that's great when it does, but you know, it's pretty good to be cautious about it. So always think about the fact, you know, 
they're golden rules because they're golden rules. So, so you should think, of, don't ask it unless you know what they're going to say. And uh, should be yes and no. And, uh, and what you should do is, if they're not answering yes and no, you should ask the judge always. Could you instruct the, the witness that this is a yes or no question? Or you, you request the judge to, 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 to get involved instead of arguing. Um, it works great because all of a sudden they, if they start answering yes and no as soon as I say one thing. It, doesn't ha it happens almost every time. And if you then go back to that, instead of you trying to deal with a witness who's going off um, and not answering your questions that you do know the answers to. Next question. Um, tell me some of the rules of evidence that too many trial lawyers have not mastered. Well, this is one I get because uh, right. I, I know I have that one. Right. Uh, you know, the, the one that gets to me the most is the business records exception. So <laughs> for a lot of reasons, and I've seen it so many different times from the first I start, first started and different judges have different ways of handling, but I remember out in Pittsburgh doing misdemeanors that would come up. It comes up like for all, all the time. And all you have to do, you got a little checklist. It says right inside of it, it's got the things. There's like five things. You got to do each one, check them off as you do it, and then you're going to make it. But what happens is people don't, and they don't think about it ahead of time. So if you're ever going to be using the business records exception to get a document in, um, be sure, okay, and then just go down the list. You got the five, you just check each one, you go right down the list, and then you got them all, you're good, you're golden. Um, sometimes judges will like let you know you missed one, but not tell you what one you missed. <laughs> sometimes they just won't say anything, they'll just smile when the objection comes and say sustained. Um, and there's nothing that is more, I, you look in the face of the attorney and they're just panicked and don't know why it's happening. Um, and, and, uh, it really is, it's one that's easy to be pre to prepare for and make sure you do. Um, other one is hearsay. Uh, you don't know how many times I get hearsay ob objections when they forget they got the first part, it's this out of court statement, but it has to be for the truth of the matter, uh, 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 that, that is being submitted. So it's not most of the, a lot of times the statement is not for the truth of the matter. Great example, um, say there's like a fight and uh, plaintiff has the defendant up. There's a fight between the plaintiff's attorney has the defendant on the stand, cross-exam. Um, the, the, the plaintiff's attorney says, uh, isn't it uh, uh, true that you said right before the, uh, uh, the fight that uh, my client was an idiot and that he was ugly too? And then you get from the defense attorney, you get objection hearsay and then... Well, wait, no, it's not for the truth. I don't think, uh, sir, a, a plaintiff attorney, are you submitting this to prove that your client's an idiot and ugly too? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> and it, you just look like a, like like an idiot and maybe ugly too. Uh, <laughs> it's not a good thing. So think about it before you automatically make an objection that's hearsay. Um, whenever you hear anything about that statement out of court, I get it a lot in court. People just immediately when they hear, it triggers them um, that somebody said something outside of court. Oh, good, hearsay, your honor. And then then all of a sudden it's not. So um, yeah, you, you gotta be cautious about it. I think there's a movie out there that recommends somewhere anytime your head hits the council table, you're taking a nap. The first thing that should happen when you wake up is you say, I object, right? Um, <laughs> right. You know, I think that for the purposes of answering this question, I'm gonna answer it really broadly because I'm gonna go back to something Teresa said earlier. No two ways to get every piece of evidence in before you go to trial. Do that, do that, do that, do that. And then do it again, maybe get three ways if you can. Um, it just, it never ceases to amaze me what happens in trial, um, which judges go which directions on which issues. Some things I think should happen a certain way and they don't. And so we have to prepare for the possibility that that piece of evidence isn't gonna come in and either find a way to get it in 
or find a way to get the information from that piece of evidence in through testimony or something else. Testimony is your friend. Um, you will find a way to get it in. There are plenty of ways. Um, you just have to think about it ahead of time and plan. That's the biggest thing about trial that I will just say in general, have a plan, but then be prepared to throw it in the trash. Yeah, no, I agree. So um, I think business records exception. So what I do is before trial, I will approach the opposing counsel with the record, usually the medical record, because I do personal injury. I will ask them to stipulate to authenticity and certain parts I want it in. If you can get the stipulation, um, then you don't need to go through this. But if you can, then subpoena the records. So the custodian and records uh, will have a declaration, at least the foundation facts, the business record exception is there. Then all you need to prove is the recordation of event condition or occurrence. Um, so that will be there. So try to always approach um, the opposing counsel to see if you can stipulate. Could their records, they want to get in and they don't want to go through the business record exception either. So <laughs> I try to work with the opposing counsel. I think that's important. And then just, yeah, everything, try to figure out a different way to get in. I had a trial, the judge didn't allow me to use my client's MRI image. Says it was, uh, what was, it was uh, duplicative because the report is already in. So I can't use the MRI. So I drew on the board and then just said, no, you cannot use that either because my drawing apparently is too realistic. So then I asked my expert to draw on the board as he testified. So that got in. I had the case where I tried to use the recording and judge says, I need to take a break right in the middle of my cross. <laughs> so I come back, try to go back and ask the question to lay the foundation to show the context because where we were 10 minutes ago, judge sustained objections as asking the answer. So what do you do? I pull the transcript. That's a different exhibit, a transcript of that recording. Then I'm asking different questions because it's a different exhibit and you get your thing in. You just got to be flexible and think about different ways to get things in <laughs> and be creative. Try to get the things you want to get in, get in, you know. This is an open question. It harkens back to something that Eva mentioned a moment ago. So I'm going to start with Eva. Segwaying to the topic of expert witnesses. Right. We, I think we've been focused on percipient to this point. Eva, should you ever argue with an opposing expert witness? So <clears throat> I'm going to say, based on experience, you can. Um, we had a case where we had an expert show up to trial. Um, it was on a complex uh, regional pain syndrome case. So she had a really uh, severe injury. It's really nasty. Um, she was going through some terrible things. And the defense proffered a doctor to an orthopedic surgeon to testify that she didn't have uh, complex regional pain syndrome. And um, instead of um, doing it a different way, we decided that we were going to go after this doctor on cross exam. Um, and so we ended up basically going after his qualifications in kind of an unplanned way. And it turned into a really big argument in court um, between uh, my partner at the time, Dan, and the witness. And it was pretty intense. Um, and it was something that I was concerned about because I watched it from counsel table and went, oh my gosh, I don't know if this is okay. How is everyone going to react to these two men being aggressive with each other in a courtroom about these topics? Um, my other partners at the time had watched the testimony as well. And they had similar concerns. We all were very concerned that these two people had argued during their testimony. We were concerned that that would make it so that the jury didn't hear what was happening. Um, at the end of the case, we won. We got a very good verdict out of the case, um, ended up being a 75% liability on our client, but 2.7 million worked out okay. Um, and I asked the jurors at the end, I said, did you care that we were arguing with this witness? So did it bother you? And they all said, no. We fully understood why you felt like you had to go after him as hard as you did. Um, and it shocked me because I thought for sure, based on how all of the lawyers in the room were reacting to the situation, that we were going to have bad juror feedback. We didn't. They were more than happy to watch it because they felt like the level of you know, uh, 
the level of indignance that was there between the attorney and the um, examining and the witness was right. They felt like it matched what was going on. So I think as long as you're going to take it down that course and know where you're going to go, it could turn out okay. I don't know if I would recommend it for everybody, though. Arguing, I think sometimes, I mean, judges don't like it. So um, they'll pull the rug out from my, I know I do sometimes when they get they start arguing with an expert. The experts are really good at testifying usually and good at arguing back. You end up talking over each other so the court reporter can't take it down. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's so the court reporter starts throwing their hands up and saying, okay, I can't even get that. And then everybody looks kind of, kind of amateurish. So um, it's, it's, if it's short, like a burst, <laughs> you could, I think that works kind of, but if you're in a prolonged, this is somebody I'm going to just start taking on and arguing, you end up interrupting, you end up doing a lot of things. Judges don't like it. So I know I don't. Um, uh, but at the same time, I've let it go sometimes if it, if it's done appropriately and, and people can stay in control, but it's rare that they can, they get, they talk over yeah, each I'll other and that causes problems. I'll say that we have had in other, in other circumstances uh, where witnesses have gotten excited, uh, and tried to argue, um, and where we didn't engage, uh, we get a lot of the the court reporter with the hands up in the air had one lady screaming at us um, one day for everybody to slow down. So keep deep. That's very good advice. Your court reporter is really important. It's a little bit different now than it used to be because my old court reporter, uh, BJ, she, she would do, she'd go, do you want to take it down or what? In front of the, <laughs> front of the jury. She would, she, would, she would do, she'd do that. But, but, but now you hire your own. So you bring them in, they're a little bit nicer and it actually, I have to protect them more, I think, in a way, yeah. because they feel it's hard for the court reporter to object to the person that's paying her uh, or him uh, in, in the court. It's a difficult thing, I think, to to do. And so uh, I can see because I see the screen like behind them. I know exactly what's going on. And uh, and I hear the size and <laughs> and so I feel like I, I have to do something here sometimes. My clerk will throw something at me, uh, you know, hey, hey, the court reporter here is having a problem. They get a little note. So you, you, you got to make sure that you watch out for the court reporters. I, I have never argued with a witness at trial, so I don't know how that's perceived. Um, but I also think there's a little difference in terms of power dynamics. So if you have a plaintiff, uh, I was on the defense side and uh, my mentor, Casey Ward, who had tried over hundred cases, he told me you never cross examine a widow in a wrongful death case, you don't do it. Whatever the information you can get, make sure you get it from somebody else. Um, I think it depends on the witness. I think if it's expert, it might be different because expert testify hundreds of times. Uh, nobody feels bad for them. They're getting paid like a gazillion dollars. Yeah to show up, maybe it's different, but I have never argued with any witness at trial. So I don't know how, and also I think there might be a gender difference. Like if a, if a female lawyer is, is, I don't know how that's perceived. Um, I have never done it. I agree with you, Teresa. I think it might be, um, one of the issues that I was concerned about was um, my partner's tall. He's over six feet tall, and this was a small courtroom, right? And so everybody's really close in there. It's like, whoa, this kind of is aggressive, right? And, you know, smaller people might have a different reaction to that. So, and I've just been surprised by jurors' reactions to the things um, that we do. I just, just very surprised. I've had a juror faint at a description of a shoulder injury before. So it's always a little bit, I never know exactly how they're going to react to what we're doing. And I know a lot of time, I think um, jury don't really tell the truth when you're interviewing them because they know you're the lawyer from the other side. So they will say things that's, you know, they're not going to tell you 100%. Um, and then also based on how you ask the questions, if you're asking open-ended questions versus leading, they might feel the need to help you a little. I, I, and then a lot of time people don't really know what they're really thinking. A lot of time they make decisions based on emotional factor, then they 
try to justify it with certain facts. You just, it's hard to read people's mind. These, these questions or these comments rather are wanting me to kind of double back to something super important uh, Judge Austin touched on. Um, I'll preface it by saying that, you know, in family law, where very frequently, I mean, the, you know, a lot of the evidence will be coming through my own mouth in the sense of we're making offers of proof at a, at a law in motion type hearing. Um, and one of the things I very much aspire to, don't, I don't think that I always achieve it, but I certainly tell clients, it's my objective to, to be the most reasonable person in the room, okay? And, um, and the enemy sometimes is what Judge Austin was talking about, about get it becoming so closely emotionally enmeshed in your case. Um, so, uh, and I think, a, you, that, I think that's, that's a universal problem or a universal issue. Uh, including in, in other aspects of civil. So my question to you all is, how do you balance an appropriately fervent belief in the truth of your narrative, right, which, which we all have to have if we're going to sell that narrative? How do you balance that against the risk of getting carried away? Focus groups. That's a hard question. <laughs> it is, because you need it. You got to have you got to have buy-in with your client um, and that jury has to know or the judge knows that you believe in your client uh, and what your client's saying. Same time, you can't go over. If you go over, everybody sees through it and uh, you can't do that. I mean, we, we love, and the jurors I think like kind of professorial attorneys. Um, you, you appear to be neutral, yet you're advocating. And, um, and that works really well if you have the right personality type for it. Some people can't do it, but um, it works pretty well when you see it. It's just, for most people though, that's hard to do. You gotta buy into what your client's saying. You have to believe in it and you have to show that you, you, you do. You just can't go overboard. And where that line is, you just, it's one of those things you have to know by experience, I think more than anything else, just trying it. And, and looking back after each trial, did I go too far believing? Did I do? Did I project in a way that maybe was uh, inappropriate? Um, you should do that analysis after every trial, even short court trials or anything that you're doing to see whether or not you're projecting in a way that might not be appropriate. Yeah, I think experiences. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's one yeah, thing. Yeah, it is. Sure. Um, yeah, the experience, I think. And then also, um, I have a number, lucky enough to have a number of mentors. So I would, I would talk to them about my case. And they're very brutally, brutally honest about, you know, the cons of my case. Because I only see the pros. Because, you know, obviously, I like the case. That's why I took it. Um, that's why I'm spending time and money on the case. But um, we all have our blind spots. And then the only way to learn is from experience or um, getting good advice from other lawyers or focus group. Yeah, that's, I'll just go back to saying focus groups and exactly what everyone else has said. Reach out to the people that are around you and ask them questions. Ask them questions about your cases. Um, trust focus groups. I mean, not implicitly, right? Take everything your lawyer take everything with a grain of salt, right? But at the same time, reach out and get other information. We're not the ones that decide these cases if we're going to trial. We need to care about what our jurors are gonna think, what our judge is going to think about the information that we're presenting. So whether I feel strongly about a case or not is kind of beside the point. I need to know what 12 other people who aren't lawyers are gonna think about it. And so that's usually why we go to focus groups when we get closer to things. Obviously we, the other thing that I do is um, internally uh, in my, within my office, I always make sure to poll my employees about what they think about a case um, because they will sometimes give me some feedback that is like, whoa, that is just shocking to me. All right. Um, they have different viewpoints on some of the stuff that just doesn't even come to my mind. So um, I would just say, open up the topic for discussion with the people around you um, and listen to what they have to say. My, my own contribution to my own question uh, is, 
two two things. Number one, uh, you know, I coached uh, my son's baseball, and I see the the highs and lows. You know, success at the plate. They make an error in the field. They they get down. And there's a there's a saying that you hear professional baseball players say all the time, and I think it should be applied in our profession, and that is, don't let your highs be too high, and don't let your lows be too low. Um, that kind of of try to even it out as much as you can, and that will help maintain that that detached objectivity. Um, you know, and uh, uh, you know, treat success and failure both as the imposters that they are. Okay. Judge Weil, I heard him say once, you know, kind of on this, this same point. Um, uh, he said that don't misconstrue your successes as an affirmation of anything that you've done as a lawyer and don't interpret your failures as an indictment of anything that you've done. Um, and that's, that, that's an important thing to keep in mind. And okay, three things. The third, the third thing is we've, we've probably all heard the old saw. If you have the facts, pound the facts. If you have the law, pound the law. If you have neither, pound the table. <laughs> so what I mean by that in this context is if you find yourself pounding the table, that's telegraphing to everybody that you have neither law nor fact on your side. So resist that urge. Um, all right, uh, moving away from you know more philosophical and into the more technical. Um, I wanna know what everybody does, and Judge Austin, what you have seen and what you like the best in terms of, of use of a transcript at trial, right? Um, do you play a video? Uh, you like that? What are the pros and cons of that? Do you, uh, do you read from the transcript? If you do, do you, the lawyer, read both the question and the answer? Or do you read the question and have somebody else read the answer? How do you, how do you, um, how do you do it? Do you want me to take what I like to watch? Please. I can go first, yeah. yeah um, and videos work great. So um, if you're, but only if you're technologically capable. So if you're not, it's just a nightmare. So remember, this is all somebody, assuming somebody knows how to push the buttons and get the thing up. And, and usually you could have somebody that you know that works in your firm that's really good with computer stuff. Um, don't do it yourself because it just won't work. Um, or you have to hire somebody that's going to be in there that's able to do it and, and rely on them to be able to make sure that they do it because not always can, can, can they do it. Um, if it screws up, I've had jurors because the jurors now they're all like techie gut people in the jury. They'll tell you how to do it. Oh, you got to push this, uh, do control F on that thing. And then it'll come up. You go, well, what? you don't want your jurors, you know, uh, saying it if you have repeated problems. So don't, but good. when it works, it works great. I mean, you got most of the time there's a great big head of the person who's sitting the little head on the stand is their big head on the, the 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 screen as it's projected up there and they're saying something completely different than what they just said um if it's really that uh, which is something i want to get into but if 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 it is it's very very effective and if you can recognize what that is and, and something that you get good at a depot on a video and use it over and over again, because you sometimes can use it, you use it in closing, you could use it with other witnesses, uh, if, especially if it's a party that's staying at the deposition. Um, uh, that's a good thing, good, good thing to do. Um, I think it's important to, if you're going to read the depot transcript to just do it yourself, do it matter of factly. You don't have to go each time through with the witness who said something different and you're about ready to impeach them from you because you have it written down in your notes that they said this, you know what the, they said in their depot when you ask the question. So they should agree with that. Um, and then they say something different. Um, you've got it there. It's just as fine just to say, well, okay, I've got your deposition here. So you could ask the judge to read the deposition instruction, what a deposition is the first time. And I, I usually do that the first time that anybody impeaches from a deposition and it's testimony, just like testimony in a court of law, it's under oath. And then um, just read what they say 
and then we move on to the next one. Um, you don't have to say, do you recall January 22nd, 1920? When you took your deposition, you were in my office. Do you recall that I told you anything you have to say? You said tell the truth and that you should do a complete and you had an opportunity to review that deposition. People do that and they'll do it repeatedly with the same witness. It's just crazy. Uh, so they go, so you just want to get in, get out. And then you can comment on it later at the time of your closing that they said, you see all those things they said that were different, you know, be sure you're impeaching them. For, if it's a deposition, that is something important because if it's not important, it wastes everybody's time and it makes you look foolish. So sometimes they'll say something that's technically a little different or it'll be something that's not really important. Like, okay, say it's a, it's a auto accident or something and, and the, the deposition, they said they ate at Togo's that morning. And then, then later in the afternoon, they got in the rack and then you're asking the question and they said they ate at Subway. Well, do you, do you recall your deposition or, or you just bring it out and then you read it that they went to Subway instead of Togo's? Nobody cares. It has nothing to do with anything. Um, and a lot of times people will do that just because it's a different answer. So you have to think about it and you're, as you're going. Is this something that's worth wasting everybody's time? And, and is it going to make me look silly and not make the, them look? like they're not telling the truth. And we use, we do a lot of stuff with depositions, but if we're using it in our case in chief, um, it will be planned out ahead of time and there will be a clip. Um, clips on the fly are very, very difficult to make. Um, and so usually what happens when, when we're in the moment um, is we get a transcript and we use the transcript to impeach. Um, we've had situations before where a judge let us just display it on the screen. Um, most of the time we try to have our tech capability set up ahead of time to make it as smooth as possible for this part, because like Judge Austin said, I don't think I want a juror telling me how to do it. Um, just try to plan it out ahead of time. And if the clips aren't going to work, because it happens sometimes, I've had them fail from moving from a USB drive on one computer to another computer and they just don't work anymore. Um, if it happens, just prepare for another method. Stand up and read from the deposition instead, and it'll be okay. Um, situations where I've had situations in the past where we've done one attorney reading questions and one attorney reading answers. Um, it usually results in comedy um, <laughs> between the two. Somehow it just ends up somebody will read too quickly or something or nobody understands. And in the moment, the person on the stand gets called Dr. So-and-so and the jurors usually end up laughing. Um, I don't know if it's useful or not uh, to do it that way. I think that sometimes it's best just to stand up and read exactly what it is. Um, if it's a short thing, I wouldn't spend a lot of time on it. If you're gonna do a long thing where you're worried about the jury actually being interested, then yeah, maybe having two people reading back and forth is important. Um, um, but that's the other thing I would say about video depots. If you're going to play a long portion of it, just try to make sure that it's not too boring um, or take a stretch break because they do fall asleep. Especially afternoon when you yes. turn the lights down low. Yeah. It, it's never happened to video. me, but... Uh... <laughs> <clears throat> Um, I would only add that um, when you uh, want to do cross-examination, you could technically hold the transcript in your hand and then you ask the question, because sometimes the question in depot is not the same as in trial, but you ask the answer that they gave. So, so when it's time to impeach, it's a perfect impeachment, not that you ask the same question. You want to impeach on the answer because the answer is the evidence, not the question. Um, and then a lot of time, just having the transcript in your hand and you ask a question by reading a transcript, not saying that you're reading a transcript, that created enough uh, pressure on the witness to give you what you want because they know if they say something differently, they will be impeached. And it's better to have a, a good answer that's uncontroverted uh, um, then having two different answer, one is yes, one is no, because you don't know which one the jury is going to believe. So if you get a choice 
you want them to say the things you want them to say. You don't want them to say the light was green and then you read that post as light was red, then maybe the jury's falling asleep, uh, only heard the red part, not the green part, or they start sneezing, so didn't hear the green part. I don't know. Um, you don't wanna take that chance. Um, and reading that position, I think um, you wanna make sure that position is lodged with the court uh, before you uh, cross-examine them. And uh, when they give the wrong answer or the inconsistent answer, you say, Your Honor, I would like to read uh, defendant's deposition, page blah, line blah to blah. And then the judge will have the transcript, the original one. Uh, if you don't have the original, make sure you get stipulation that the certified is okay. Um, and then the judge will ask the other side, any objections? No objection. Okay, you read. And you just read question, da -da -da, answer, da -da -da. and you do not ask any questions after that. When I was oh. in law school, I was trained to say, did I read that correctly? That was a horrible idea because the witness never answered my question. If I read it correctly, clear, I read it correctly. But what you did is you just give the witness an opening and then they start saying, yeah, you did answer it correctly. But when I said it, I meant this or something else, whatever they come up with. I was under so much pressure, you know, like, you know, I was really hungry. I had a headache when this happened. You do not ask any of that question. Just question, blah, 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 answer, blah, blah. Then you move on. Um, do not ask a question about did you did I read it correctly or or anything you would like to explain or <laughs> why did you say that then and now you say that now uh, you don't say a word <laughs> you know and if I could echo make make sure that the tra original transcripts are with the clerk so you you sometimes people have somebody else deliver them or something else that's on you so if you're going to be doing the, the the testimony and you're the one that's impeaching from the deposition you got to make sure that that original depo is with the clerk before you get started so all you have to do is walk over right before that witness is up if you know they're coming up in that session make sure that the the, the clerk has the deposition because if they don't then the clerk goes the clerk, okay i don't have I, I the judge can i have the thing and then the clerk, i don't have the thing and then the jury's looking and it makes you look unprofessional and then the people fish around they try to find it. it takes a while they get the deposition they're always in these funny crinkly paper that makes a lot of noise when you open them so then the clerk gets it the clerk is like mad at you because they didn't give it so then they make it crinkle for longer than what they have to and it crinkles 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 and then, <laughs> I mean, we've all heard that noise i don't know why this they make them like that but but it's, my just, worst nightmare. Every, it's like crinkled candy in the in the movie theater for some reason that sound and it really is one of those like embarrassing kind of moments and it, and then you're all set for your you're gonna impeach somebody and then now the it's all deflated so make yeah, sure no. it's all there the judge has it go right to the page don't get crazy about it and like start to read it right away when you say the page in line because the judge has to read it opposing counsel has to read it. You have to make sure that, because we're the only ones getting to see it, that there isn't an objection. The judge usually says any objection and then the, the opposing counsel will say no and then you get to read it. So there's a whole process between it and you make sure you do it. Because if you don't start rushing, it again makes you look like um, you don't know what you're doing. I've got a follow-up question for Judge Austin. Um, you, you, I believe, commented that you really like video. Uh, well, I've seen it be really okay. effective. Yeah. Um, so the question is, 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 is that, does that comment apply to bench trials as much as it does jury trials, which of course is all I care about because that's all we do in family law. Not as much, but if you've got something good, it doesn't hurt. I could tell you, because a lot of times people just don't understand when they're in deposition that this thing that they're doing and they're battling you across the table is going to get blown up and that everyone's going to see them at trial. Just not going to. I had a trial. I, I mean, the one that I always think of, I have was a long time ago, really good lawyer. And it was um, an accident at a railway crossing that was like not with, didn't have a gate. It was like over a private property like an easement and there was no gate there and there was a, 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 a serious accident and the railroad company thought it was a good idea when they asked like most knowledgeable about like the black box most knowledgeable about gates most knowledgeable about speed of trains they they, they 
identified the same guy. And so the plaintiff went and deposed this guy for like seven days on each one of the topics. And the guy got tired of it. And at one point he asked him, well, why don't you just put these gates up at all these uncontrolled intersections? And he, and the guy was frustrated, you could tell. And he said, he goes, well, that would just cost too much money. Why would we ever do that? If we did one, we have to do it everywhere. And then <laughs> he played it about this giant head. He played that about 10 times and he ended up making several million dollars off the case. And, uh, um, but it was a lot of time over time, got the one answer that he wanted, had it on video and it was devastating. It, it harkens back to uh, Soviet style interrogation, which it was a little bit like that, actually. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I could go in for seven days of my my client being deposed, but um, OK. Um, moving on to something else technical uh, related to when your witness is on the stand, you finish direct. The other side crosses your witness. Then you have the opportunity to redirect. Um, the question is, how do you avoid opening the door on redirect? And what, what does it mean to open the door to re on redirect? And why is that such a perilous pitfall? Well, it, it, it happens. It happens to everybody because they're trying to clear up something bad that happened in the testimony. <laughs> and so that's kind of why you're doing the redirect. Um, there's usually been a motion to eliminate that precludes some evidence from coming in. Um, and uh, you can, if you basically paint the wrong picture of what actually happened, you end up opening the door. And people are, they tend, I, I think there's a real temptation to, to do that. Um, so if you are, very clear that whatever questioning you do, you're not trying to paint a picture of not of what um, of not what actually happened, but based on what's coming into evidence, painting a different picture of what happened. Um, then then you're okay. But it's there's a real tendency to do that to paint a picture that is consistent with what the evidence is that's come in, and is painting a is is letting the jur jury know something that, or creating a perception that's untrue. And judges just don't want that. It's something that we feel very bad about. Um, and if you do that, you will oftentimes open the door to let in what the real evidence was that had already been excluded. So there's no reason to do anything like that. It's a temptation, uh, a fool's mission. Don't do it uh, because judges don't like it. And they'll, they'll, let, they'll say, okay, We'll, we'll, we're going to let this in now. You just blew it. <laughs> that's pretty much what ends up happening. You don't say it in front of the jury, but that's what happens. I would just say that if you're going to open the door on, on redirect, be really careful about what you're doing, right? Um, if it's something that, that you've managed to, to keep out this whole time, um, there's probably a reason that you want it out. Don't, don't go there. I, I would, if you can avoid opening the door to bad stuff during redirect, avoid it. Um, that said, if there's bad stuff that is going to come out on cross that you need to deal with, you shouldn't be dealing with it on redirect. You should be dealing with it at the front with a balloon and a pin. And you should be getting it out at the very beginning. Um, situations where stuff has to come up and redirect or you're opening the door and redirect are generally bad situations in my opinion. Um, and I usually try to avoid them like the plague by getting the bad facts out at the beginning. And this is, again, goes back to asking my clients for the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because if I don't know what that is, I can't prepare for it. But if I do, we don't have to deal with this redirect opening the door issue. We can deal with it at the beginning. Take away all the power. I think, yeah, so I think you wanna think about if I were the opposing counsel, and you kind of know going into the trial, because as Judge Austin said, you probably filed a motion to eliminate and that motion was granted condition on whatever happens at trial. And you know what facts you wanna keep out. And when you do the redirect, you wanna think about if I were the opposing counsel, how would I get that facts in? Can I get that in? Did I open a door? 
So you want to think about those things and you definitely don't want to open a door. <laughs> do not do that. A redirect should always be short. You should figure out exactly why you want to do it and that something happened and you want to clear that up. It should be a couple of questions. You shouldn't go into much more than that. You want to just get off the stage because what it does is the longer you ask questions, the more time that the opposing party is going to get second shot at your witness. So, so why would you want that? It's probably better to think, do I want to allow a second shot at my witness or should we just go out the door now and, and, and leave? Uh, because it's not, don't just think about what you're going to ask, think what they're going to ask as, as a, a recross. So uh, why give them the opportunity? And, and if the witness did horribly on the stand, you probably do not want to re, do redirect. If there's no way to rehabilitate the witness, you just want this witness to be out as soon as possible. Out the Get door. Out your <laughs> next witness. Hopefully nobody was listening, thinking about dry cleaning. You know, that's not really important. Yeah. Next, Let's get somebody new to think about here. Because then if you stand up, you give the chance of the other side to go for it again. So it is uh, six o'clock. And I want to reiterate to the audience, um, you know, so what I said at the beginning, we really want more questions. Now I have one more coming, but there are 26 attendees here today. Uh, and I can, I can tell that among you are very accomplished litigators, trial lawyers, and judicial officers. So I'm, I'm hoping and expecting uh, uh, questions, comments, you know, words of wisdom that we'd, we'd like uh, to share. So please do chime in. And I have a, a judicial officer retired here uh, that's, I'm sure, skilled at admonishing uncooperative, you know, participants. So <laughs> don't, don't make me go there. Um, I'm happy to see that we have one question from uh, my esteemed colleague, Patrick Goonan, who asks, are there any other subtle ways the panelists use to get a witness to cooperate during cross-examination, an adverse witness? Things like pausing or changing direction in questioning, things like that. The one thing, and I'll, I'll chime in with, with uh, uh, something that my civil procedure Professor Davis, who I know Adam Carlson uh, was in my class for that because it was our first year, uh, uh, talked about a technique that I've kind of used maybe once or twice, maybe to good effect. Um, it, it only works in depositions, or it's primarily for depositions, where, of course, as we know, depositions, the flow of depositions with an adverse witness is going to be wherever possible you have documents and you show them exhibits and then you show them the next exhibit and you show them the next exhibit. Um, and before you show them the exhibit, you ask them the question that the exhibit is intended to elicit. You pulled out $36,000 from your joint bank account and moved it to the Caymans, right? Okay. And then no, well, here's the statement and here's the other statement. Okay. okay. Then you go through that and then you have a question that you think that you really want the answer to. It's an important question but you don't have an exhibit for it. But you do, the, you do what you've been doing up to that point, and that is pull out the paper, some piece of paper, and ask the question. And again, Soviet-style interrogation, okay? This might be, might be from that. You know, you, you're, you're Pavlovian dogging the, the witness to condition them to, to just, come on, just give me the answer, you know, please. You know, so that's, that's my contribution. What say you guys? Uh, I think when they say something, they don't answer your question, you could say, I understand, but you didn't answer my question. And then you just, you just ask the other question, you ask the question again. Um, and if the one is going to long winded speech about explaining something, uh, I have seen some lawyer doing this, he would uh, look at his watch and pace back and forth a little bit. I'm just waiting for this witness. Cause that, that only works if the witnesses start getting really argumentative and not really answering and getting to a rant. Um, then you kind of signal to the jury that this guy is out of control and is not really telling the truth. Don't listen to him. And he's not answering your question. But you don't want to get into a yelling match with the witness. You cannot lose your cool. 
you gotta have control. My two rules, uh, my biggest rule, you get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Mm. Um, you are gonna get good stuff out of witnesses if you're nice to them. Don't be mean, if you're, there's no point to it. You're not gonna get what you want out of it. It's just gonna make you feel bad at the end. Um, and the other, oh, I forgot the other rule. I totally ran out of my head. I'll remember it at some point. I was looking at our second question I think up it's, here. You, you could, when, when the witness is being evasive or is, has some trick that they're trying to do, talk long-winded, um, you know, you dive things and there's a lot of stuff that you can do. Okay, let's try it another way. And then you, 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 you say it, like preface it with that. And then you go and they go, guess that didn't work. Uh, let's go this way. And then you, you end up can do it in a way. So you sort of make fun of the witness for being evasive and for not participating in the process the way that they're supposed to. And, um, and, and that's a good thing. So a lot of times the witnesses are like that when you're the trial judge and you're not getting any input from the attorney who wants, you know, say, hey, could you instruct them to answer or anything like that? I, I don't usually go in because I think that the attorney has, is realizing the jury's not liking this guy. And so, so I, I want to just keep asking questions just because they're, they're evading and they're doing, you know, kind of sleazy things. And, the, and, and uh, you know, the, a lot of times the attorney will mug for the jury before they ask the next question or something like that. Um, and so it does work from the attorney's point of view. So you don't necessarily need to have the cross-exam go the way that you've planned it to have an effective cross-examination. You can attack the person's credibility by just letting them be themselves if they're being, being that way. <laughs> I was gonna make up some words, but I can't do that. <laughs> I was thinking of a couple. <laughs> what about, what about, what about uh, moving the court? to admonish the witness to give an answer that's responsive to the question. I mean, that's, I mean you could always do that and that's yeah. good. A lot of us, when that goes on and you're the judge, you just want to get things moving, man. And so, you know, you know, that, I, I'm pretty sure that was a yes or no. Let me look. Yeah, it was. And so I'll look back because we got real time. So then we'll look and then, and then they go. And then I kind of would sort of give them the business a little bit too after a while. Um, yeah, that was a yes or no too. And, and you know, then next thing the jury's laughing at me and uh, uh, it kind of disarms the witness and they start behaving the way they're supposed to. Loosen up a little bit. Uh, uh, Gary Cornwall asks a really good question um, that leads to some technical Sanchez issues. How do you prepare examination of an expert where there is a Sanchez issue before the court? Always a hot topic, Sanchez. Um, I try to have the foundational facts when they testify before the expert, uh, but sometimes experts are hard to book. Uh, they can be prima donna sometimes. Um, so then you ask, uh, assuming this is the fact, uh, like you can always ask question based on assumption and then you can later on prove the assumption to be true. Uh, with facts subsequent. Um, I don't think Sanchez preclude you to ask, ask hypothetical questions. Right, this is hard. People, um, especially civil, the, you know, the, I don't think the case, the, the, the Court of Appeal really thought about civil applications when they did it. Um, uh, and it's just, it's very difficult. It's difficult for attorneys um, to, to know that, and if the attorneys are having a hard time understanding, can you imagine the experts? It's hard for them. They don't know what they can rely on and what they can't. It's uh, and what they can testify about, especially old timers. You know, they have a way of doing things that they've always done, and now it's all different. So it's it's a very difficult thing. Uh, the whole Sanchez world um, that people are just going to have to come to grips with, which it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> I would just say work in close contact with your expert because we, if we, if there's a Sanchez issue with an expert, I frame it up uh, in the motion and eliminate. We get it going at the beginning, and I try to get it dealt with before we ever get the expert on the stand. Um, of course, we do have sometimes. Sometimes our judges don't want to make decisions, or they can't make decisions on our motions and eliminate at the beginning, um, and so it pushes things a little closer to when the expert has to testify. Just stay in close contact. Be prepared to. Um, 
to change their testimony around a little bit, depending on what your rulings are. Um, but again, that's just another course of be prepared. That's but, the and biggest thing. When it comes to Sanchez, it's it's surprising to me how many lawyers are still kind of unaware of it. Um, uh, that you wouldn't think that that would be the case, uh, and because it's taken longer for it to move into civil. Um, and uh, it, you really need to to know when you're dealing with experts, the whole Sanchez thing, and study up on it. Make sure you know what it is that you need to have. The, the the how how you can get the evidence in so that it can be relied on by your expert um and and methods to kind of expand what they can rely upon and tell the jury about and then also just uh you know before trial you maybe approach the opposing counsel and see if any exhibits that can be stipulated into they have the same issue they have their expert they also have sanchez issue a lot of times they want certain things in and uh, if you know that you it's going to come in you might well just stipulate to it and these things and you won't have problem with tons of objections during your expert's testimony i've had some trials like that where the parties are stipulated around sanchez and we've got to put it on the record is it you know with with this in mind um is it a good idea to pay your experts to show up for every day of trial um with a view towards you know uh having them able to say yes i heard this evidence and i considered it you know um as opposed to whatever work that they did before the trial which they're relying on i always get an order that my that all testifying witnesses are excluded yeah they can't um, really be the in courtroom. the courtroom yeah. yeah. So what I what I've done in the past when we have issues like this, um, we do sometimes give uh, trial testimony to our experts if there's something that's come up that's um, that's different or new. Um, we'll give it to them there. But generally speaking, like I said, we have it figured out ahead of time. We know where they're going to go. And this stipulation um, topic, we've done that before as well. Um, it's always a good way to if you don't want an appealable issue or anything like that, just stipulate that it can, you can work around a lot of things with a step. Yeah, I've had them give uh, like rough transcripts that you get daily or and those kind of things. Yeah, the experts can look at that, but it's a very it's hard. It's a hard. <laughs> it's just a hard deal uh, getting any of the Sanchez issues with some of the experts. It's very difficult. So here's another question, you know, as it's now, you know, well after six and, and the uh, my lights in the office have turned off. Um, <laughs> you know, that's normally, normally this is, that, that's the alert that says, okay, go home to your wife and children, Scott. Okay. okay. Um, uh, okay. Direct. I think we can all agree. Direct is the time to tell your story, to do your narrative. You have way more control, uh, over your own friendly witnesses and what they say than what you will an adverse witness. But how much of your story, your your primary narrative, is to be told on cross, or should you just look at cross as a way to dispense with bad facts, impeach adverse witnesses, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I, I think it depends on who you are. Uh, if you're a plaintiff, uh, the defendant is part of your case, and a study shows that you need to prove liability before you talk about damage or you know, you're not gonna get as big a verdict. So defendants, a basic adverse witness is part of your case. And a lot of time my client doesn't really know, uh, it's not gonna go into the liability part, but if you're a defendant, it might be different. I think, um, you know, plenty of cases you're trying to poke holes. So it depends on uh, which side you're on. Um, so, what I do is in the deposition, I would ask those liability questions. Like the, the bus driver, I would ask him, I said, here is the uh, policy from Muni, right? You were trained to look to the left and then right, then left, because it's a safe thing to do, right? Because sometimes people might jump out the crosswalk and you will have to break, right? And if you didn't do that, you would be critical of yourself for not doing that, right? And then he answered, oh, yes, to all of that. And then ask him to authenticate the video and then ask him, you didn't look to the right, didn't you? And he fumbled around, say something like his eyeball was not moving, but he had peripheral vision, whatever. 
things he got to say, but you got this stuff you need. If you go to trial, you, you know what he's going to say on the stand because you already asked him. And in that position, the defense lawyer are less prepared because they just got the case. They just, you know, the client is showing up and they're not really ready for trial. They're just maybe a junior associate is defending the, uh, the, the, the deposition. They're not prepared. And you can get a lot of damaging uh, testimony in depo. And then when it's time to trial, it's not, you're not really asking a question you don't know the answer to. So it's, it's a little bit harder on the plaintiff side, whereas on the defense side, you know, you're trying to poke holes in the plaintiff a damage case or a liability you try to establish from your own clients. So you're not really getting that from the cross in terms of liability. Uh, sometimes you do, but then you have to be very careful if the person is very injured. You don't want to come across as cruel and, and just, yeah. So it, it's a little bit different, I think. I would say, I mean, we, I like to think of it as any points you score on cross count double. Um, mm. But, you know, that said, do I necessarily try to prove my case through cross? Not always. Um, you know, I mean, sometimes I'll call a witness under, under the adverse code to bring them up um, and deal with that ahead of time. But the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, we don't want to make a defendant cry. Um, and because uh, that never goes over well. And, you know, going after them too hard just to get your two points, it's not worth it. You're going to lose your points as soon as you those tears fall. Um, so, you know, I, I, yes, score some points that way, but moderate yourself. I've had a surprising number of trials that I've watched where plaintiff calls the, the as their first witness, the defendant uh, as an adverse witness. Yeah. And I, I don't, I, I, I've never felt that that was a good idea. It's like, you're too caught up in your case. If you think that that's the way you want to tell your story mm -hmm. Through the opposing side, you want to have your story told by people that are friendly to you. Um, and, and if you're going to call as adverse witness, maybe do it later. Um, I, I there's hubris involved. I think often when you call the defendant as right out of the blocks as a mm. as an adverse through the plaintiff. That just to me, uh, you think you know, I got such a great case, I'm going to blow them out of the water right at the beginning. And it doesn't do that. And you're, then your story's all screwed up because you got the defense story out first, not the, not your story. I'll tell the rest of the story that I was speaking from experience there. Don't call the defendant first. No, they cry. Don't do it. They cry. I, this you is never happened. know we what can happen. We, we had the hubris. We called the defendant first. Yeah. The defendant got up on the stand and said, yeah, it was terrible. I feel horrible about it. Ugh, it was awful case i mean we did not get a big verdict on that case yeah. <laughs> i will never do it again <laughs> yeah lesson learned problem solved yeah. don't do it it was a long time ago but i would not advise it happens it. a like lot said, a lot of moderate. people do it it's weird yeah. uh moderate. i think it can work there must have been some class saying this is a good thing to do sometimes but um yeah i i feels like I, maybe that's why i, I wouldn't defense do it again. most of the time in practice i'm more cautious <laughs> I, would, I would never do it again. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the, this whole Zoom existence that we have and this, this technical difficulty that I'm having here uh, leads me to this question. I don't, we didn't necessarily fully prep for it. Um, you know, in family, we do a lot of Zoom trials and a lot of Zoom hearings. Okay. Um, have you guys, you know, with more of a, oh, here it is, civil perspective, um uh uh are you are you doing that in the counties where you're appearing and if so what are some good tips and tricks for direct and cross-examination for example cross-examination how do you guard against cheating right like you know they've got a script or they've got somebody there coaching them off screen or you know they're texting their counsel or their compadre or whatever um you know what what, what, what's this experience been like for you? Are you talking about depot or, or trial? Uh, if all of the above. Um, for trial, I did one, not Zoom, but some of the witness did appear remotely. Um, it's really important to try the connection. <laughs> 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 I, I know it's no brainer, but I made the mistake that I tried the connection at 
home uh, on the weekend, but then I never got to try the connection at court. And it turned out the connection at court was horrible and it was just very not effective. It was just horrible. Um, in deposition, I usually give them uh, admonition that they're not supposed to communicate with anybody during the deposition. They're not supposed to text anybody. I, I get them to affirm that. Um, but I, I, I sometimes, if I'm suspicious, I will ask them, what are they looking at? Why are their eyeballs looking somewhere else? Um, I always take it. Um, I have seen some counsel ask a witness to turn the computer around to make sure nobody's in the room, but uh, that just means nobody is in the room at that point. <laughs> There's not much you can do, I mean, seriously. I, I think I've seen on the list of somebody got caught, uh, a defense lawyer got caught texting uh, the client during depo and somehow the plaintiff attorney got hold of that and filed a motion for sanction. But I haven't, yeah. I haven't been able to catch this. Yeah, I, and if that happens to you in deposition, you should always bring a motion about it. If you figure it out somehow and they get uh, caught. Uh, um, I've had people, okay, we're not going to do that now. We're all going to come in court and, and you're going to have your deposition in the jury room and my bailiff's going to stand there. So, so that, that's going to happen. So, because uh, you've just blown it. Uh, and, 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 you, you want to make sure the judge knows about that. We're all professionals and and sh should be doing things in a way that is professional. And um, if people don't and they they break those barriers, um, the, the judge needs to know about that. So obviously today we're not doing any death by PowerPoint, uh, just having a conversation. What do you guys think about PowerPoint at trial? Demonstratives generally. Uh, we use them a lot. Um, Demont, so PowerPoints we use uh, at the beginning and end. Um, sometimes we use them with witnesses, but we use them for opening and close. One thing I'll say, be prepared to share it if you're going to use it in your opening. Um, what we do ahead of time is I actually, um, we prepare paperwork to tell the court that we are going to have an opening PowerPoint and that we want to use exhibits in our opening. And these are the exhibits and we will share our PowerPoint with the opposing side. Um, if that's necessary, uh, we go through everything ahead of time. Um, again, preparation, just make sure that it's all set up and ready to go. And usually you can figure it out. The other option, remember this, your judge might tell you no on using a PowerPoint in your opening. So be prepared to write or to do it without it. Don't rely on it. Yeah. Hey, PowerPoints, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh. Uh, you want to go ahead? Uh, PowerPoints. Uh, um, PowerPoint's opening. Um, I've just had constant, constant problems with them because what happens is people do their PowerPoint, they get all ramped up, and, and it's all argument. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of argument <laughs> in the PowerPoint. And then you're showed up, it's the day of trial. Here's my PowerPoint, even though I've told them that they have to share it with the other side so that there can be objections, and the, they'll try to wait to the last second to not get any advantage or give the other side an advantage. And then you show up and the jury's waiting and there's this like 40 page PowerPoint. We got to go over line by line and there, there's argument in it. And it, it, it ends up sometimes you just can't give it. I just say, forget it. This is, you, you can't give the PowerPoint. It's, it's, it's got too much pr problem. And so then I feel terrible because then the person's completely at loss and has to just kind of wing it without their PowerPoint and opening, but it can happen. So be, if you're going to use one, make sure that you don't put any argument in it of any kind. Go back and look again. Go back a third time <laughs> and look and see, is that argumentative? And then uh, um, because it just tends to be people get ramped up and they, they do it that way. Um, so uh, and have the ability to, when you're in court should be all on your laptop. you will be able to just take it, take out pages, take out lines. You got somebody who understands PowerPoint to be able to do that in case the judge says at the last second, um, okay, I don't want that page. I don't want that line. Yeah, exchange your PowerPoint with the opposing counsel way ahead of time so you know all the problem and fix it. And a lot of time, if it's argumentative, you don't have to say it. You can say it. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and then also, uh, you know, PowerPoint is not supposed to be everything you're gonna say. I, I see a lot of people put a lot of words in their PowerPoint and it's, you know, the, the jury can't read tons of words on a, a, a screen. You wanna be simple and get to the point. And it should be um, helping them to understand the case, not a outline of what you're gonna say. Cause people get nervous. So they just overly rely on PowerPoint to uh, like the guidance of what they're gonna say, what the next thing they're gonna say. But that actually become too much words, too much stuff on the same screen or too much information you're trying to convey and the points get lost. Last question. If you were like me, you went to law school because you wanted to have an L. Woods cross-examination moment, all right? Obviously, I, I certainly have never had applause at the end of any of my cross-examinations, but I would love to conclude today's uh, presentation with a war story from each of you, the closest you've ever come to your L. Woods, Perry Mason, cross-examination moment. I got one. I had one, I was in trial and it was an open the door thing. I had an expert that I knew in his depth. I had a case where uh, uh, a babysitter got walked into a sliding glass door and got her leg cut really badly. Mm -hmm. And I was defending it. And the expert, there was a question about tempered and untempered glass. Uh, and the expert said, anybody knows who's got untempered glass, what the plaintiff's expert said. And uh, they, everybody knows. And if, then you should put up stickers. You have to do all this stuff if you have untempered glass. And then, and he was pretty full of himself. And so I ended up asking him if, if he had untempered glass in his house. And he, I got a little, he got a little, and he didn't know. <laughs> it was pretty funny. And so there was a motion to eliminate to keep that out. And, uh, and the judge said, well, if, if he opens the door by saying everybody knows if they have tempered glass, then it's going to come in that he doesn't know that he has tempered glass, but otherwise it was going to stay out. So my goal was to try to get him going and, and to say <laughs> that. And he eventually said, well, everybody knows they have tempered glass or not. And we couldn't help himself. And then I looked at the judge and the judge went like this. Just, <laughs> and then I got to go into it. It was great. It was great. Nobody, good. it was another one of those. I was clapping in my own head, but um, between me and the judge, the judge was kind of clapping, I think, uh, at the time. So, remember, they, like they had advance said, notice and everything, they knew that was coming from a he mile couldn't help away, himself. He and he couldn't, couldn't help himself. <laughs> it was pretty good. Uh, the one I have is, uh, is the um, cross examination of defense medical examiner. Um, medical doctor um, and it was a brain injury case. I want to establish my client couldn't swallow because the brain injury. The defense medical expert found one prior hospitalization that has the words dysphagia, which means inability to swallow. Uh, so, but there was no other evidence that he couldn't swallow. So it's very important to establish when that happened. Was it before the accident or after the accident? So I got a doctor on a stand. I wrote on the board dysphagia and then asked the doctor, what does that mean? He said, that means inability to swallow. Then I wrote another word, said dysphagia. It's an S instead of a G. I said, what does that mean? And he said, that means uh, inability to make speech. And it was like, where are you going at? And I was like, I'll get to that. And then so I say, uh, doctor, if somebody is hospitalized and cannot swallow, what kind of diet would the hospital put him on? He said it would put on liquid diet because that's a standard procedure. I was like, your uh, opinion that my client couldn't swallow before the accident is based on this hospital's records, correct? He said, yes. I was like, have you looked at what diet my client was put on by the hospital? He said, well, I'm sure I looked at it. I don't remember what that is. I, I, I don't, not, not at the spot. The hospital record was like this much pages. I don't remember. I was like, that's okay. Let's take a look at exhibit, blah, blah, blah. And this is from the speech therapist and issued diet. What diet was he on? And he said, solid, solid food diet. 
I was like, so do you think he actually had dysphagia or it was just a typo, it's actually dysphagia? I didn't really care what he said after that. I Doesn't said matter, that. Yeah. So I'm gonna tell a story about a brain injury client we had. Um, the wife was on the stand. She was the girlfriend or fiance at the time of the incident. Um, but by the time she got to stand, she was wife. She'd been on the stand all day and they had shown her photograph after photograph after photograph after photograph of her now husband living his life, showing that even though he had a brain injury, he could still do X, he could still do Y, he could still do Z um, and was still living a decent life. And there had been hours of this. It had gone on for a very long time. And so we did a very, very short redirect and got up and asked <clears throat> and said, where are all the photos of him yelling at you? Should there aren't any. Where are all the photos of you fighting? with each other about these things. And we just went down all of the things that happened with the particular brain injury that this gentleman had. It caused a lot of interpersonal conflict for him. He was very angry and um, went after things and fought with them a lot. And it became very powerful testimony. It just turned it around. Was, there are no photographs. We don't take photographs of that. We try to focus on the happy moments. It was a great moment in the trial. Um, it was one of my favorites. Love it, love it. Well, I can't say that I have anything resembling a Perry Mason moment, but I will relay um, my favorite. Uh, it was I, I'm not sure if it was Director Cross. I was examining an attorney who had prepared a marital settlement agreement, and his last name was similar to my last name. And he was an older gentleman, uh, not so old, certainly, uh, but uh, perhaps old enough to be my father. And the, the opposing party, who was also an elderly gentleman who, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, spent most of his life in a foreign country, um, uh, he, and maybe English was not his first language, um, he made a statement, I think in his opening or something, where, and he was a self-represented party, where he said, he pointed at me and he said, and that man's father did blah, 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 blah. So my favorite question on, I think it was direct examination, was uh, to the to the lawyer who prepared this, sir, are you my father? <laughs> <laughs> so I got a, I got a kick out of that. And with that, so ends our presentation. I'm very grateful to everybody uh, uh, who logged on and who is now in the process of logging off. Uh, I, I don't know if Anne has any final remarks. And there she is, and I'll hand it over to her with my gratitude. Um, thank you all very much. That was incredibly uh, interesting and entertaining. Judge Austin, thank you. I know you uh, you stuck around a little bit longer than you thought to, so we really appreciate it. Didn't mean to hold you hostage, but you know, we love you. Oh, and, it's okay. I'm happy. And we miss you. So um, thank you all very much. And uh, we'll get some great materials out to you, I'm sure, and your attendance certificates. Might even uh, might even make it for two hours since we uh, kind of hung in that, that long. So, I, I'm sorry, that's on me. My apologies, everybody. I just got so carried away. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we we got a good time. Of Scott. <laughs> so anyway, thanks all very much. Have a great evening. Okay, bye everybody. Bye-bye.